Well, I'm going to be looking at James chapter 1 and verse 26. And if you have your copy of the inspired, inerrant, infallible, preserved Word of God, open it up to James chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at pure religion. Pure religion. Or another title for my sermon, I always have two, is uh, I don't sin on Sundays. I don't sin on Sundays. <laughs> pure religion. We're going to look at um, James. Chapter 1, talking about pure religion. Well, maybe you've heard this before, and it's a Wednesday night, so I hope I get a little liberty here to read this. And maybe you've heard this before, but it's how many does it take to change a light bulb? How many charismatics does it take to change a light bulb? Maybe you don't know about this, but I grew up in charismatic church, so I know all about this. One to change a light bulb and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. How many Calvinists does it take to change a light bulb? None. God has predestined when the light bulb will be on. Calvinists do not change light bulbs. They simply read the instructions and pray the light bulb has been one that's been chosen to be changed. How many Arminians does it take to change a light bulb? All. They need everyone to make sure it stays on. One never can really be too sure. How many Baptists does it take, take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> How many Neo-Orthodox does it take to change a light bulb? Well, no one really knows. They can't tell the difference between light and darkness. <laughs> How many TV evangelists does it take to change a light bulb? It only takes one, but for the message of light to continue, send your donation today. <laughs> How many independent fundamentalists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, because if there was any more, it would result in just too much cooperation. How many liberals does it take to change a light bulb? At least ten, as they need to debate whether the light bulb even exists. If they agree upon its existence of the light bulb, they will still might not change it to keep from alienating those who might use other forms of light. How many Catholics does it take to change the light bulb? None. They use candles. How many worship leaders who use a guitar does it take to change the light bulb? One. But as soon as all those around, but soon all those around it can warm up to its glowing. And then how many members of an established fundamental Bible teaching church that, that is over 20 years old does it take to change the light bulb? One to actually change the bulb and nine to say how much they like the old one. How many Amish does it take to change the light bulb? What's, what's a light bulb? How many youth pastors does it take to change? Oh, this is bad. How many youth pastors does it take to change the light bulb? It says youth pastors aren't usually around long enough for light bulbs to burn out. <laughs> wow. Oh, my. And if you've been to Southern Baptist Church, you will appreciate this one. How many Southern Baptists does it take to change the light bulb? 109. Seven on the Light Bulb Task Force Subcommittee who report to the 12 on the Light Bulb Task Force Committee. Appointed by the 15 on the Trustee Board. Their recommendation is to review the Finance Committee of five who placed on the Gen of 18 member Finance Committee. If they approve, they will bring a motion to the 27 member Church Board who will appoint another 12 member Review Committee. If they recommend that to the Church Board proceed, a resolution is brought to the Congregational Business Meeting. They appoint another eight members to review the committee. Oh boy, etc., etc., etc. Their recommendations of which hardware store has the best buy must then be reviewed by the 23 member ethics committee to make sure that the hardware store has nothing to do with the connection to Disneyland. <laughs> they report back to the trustee board, who then commissions the trustee in charge of the janitor to ask him to change the bulb. But by then, the janitor discovers that there's one more light bulb that's burned out. Well, if we will admit it or not, sometimes man-made religion is almost funny. Because we change it so much, we make it so much about us, we forget so much about God sometimes, that it just gets almost funny. Well, let's look at James chapter 1, because James doesn't portray pure religion as humorous, does he? James chapter 1 says this in verse... 26. It says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, 
that you visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this idea that we see here about pure religion and we ask that you help us understand it, help us to soak it in and help us to use it throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the first thing I notice here is I'm coming along here. It's pure religion. You know, we, uh, one fellow once was telling me about his religion. That's where I got the, this other title from. And he was telling me about his faith. And he literally told me that. He said, Dave, he, I said, uh, he said, I don't sin on Sundays. He must have, he really missed the point to say something like that. He says, well, I just reserve my days. I don't sin for Sundays ridiculous, isn't it, that someone will make a comment like that, but they think that Sunday is the day that they're going to stop from sinning when we know as Christians our whole life should be about God and not just one particular day set aside. And some of you guys know this story, but when we were on the bike trip, we rode with this fella. He was working out and training to go on a... Um, I think he was doing an Ironman. I can't remember if it was an Ironman or a triathlon, but well, he was training and he had one of those uh, bikes with the special wheels, real expensive bikes, and he was training and he was riding that bike and we got to talking to him a little bit as we were riding because he rode with us probably, well, at least uh, maybe an hour and a half or so, uh, way out of his way, and we got to talking and uh, talking about God and talking about the Bible and he looked at Brian and he said, uh, looked down at his bike as he's riding and he said, this is my religion. This is my religion, talking about bikes and talking about training and talking about sports. <clears throat> and you know, he was right because definition of religion is this, a pursuit or interest, second definition, a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. It was the most important thing to him was that bike and the training on that bike. But, uh, the dictionary also defines religion as a particular system of faith and worship. Uh, religions tend to, um, I think James defining religion as this, as the outward appearance or the outward, what you see on the outside of an inward faith. What shows up on the outside. A religious person is usually someone who does something systematically or often. And unfortunately, religion tends to get a bad rap in Christianity. Because people say, I don't want to be religious. I have a relationship. And I agree with that statement. I understand that statement. I believe that to some extent. But he's talking about uh, pure religion. He's talking about God's religion. And let's see what he has to say about it. First of all, he says um, in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, if he seems to be religious, if he looks religious, this guy has, this guy would be a guy who does things about religion. He might pray. You might see him pray. There was a time, I was really shocked about this, and I went to a gas station several years ago, and I was paying for, I was delivering pizzas, and I wasn't supposed to be stopping to get gas, because I was supposed to fill up before I started work, right? So I'm hurrying at the gas station to get my gas, and I'm like, all right, I need to pay. And this guy, all of a sudden, this ding, ding, ding goes off, and he walks over and kneels on this pad and does a certain amount of bows, I don't know what he, exactly, and then comes back and then takes my money. He was a Muslim, and he was doing something about his faith. His religion was showing up on the outside, right? Well, not exactly. He seems to be religious. 2 Timothy 3.5 3, talks about a crowd that has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. There was a time at a church we were at, and the ladies were, there was a couple ladies vacuuming, and um, they were just working away, and I got there, and I was like, man, I should probably help these ladies. So one of them had stopped, and so I picked up, and they were using like these little stick vacuum cleaners. Never really seen one of those before, and it looked like a sweeper to me. So I got out there, and I started vacuuming away, just, just, but it wasn't doing a very good job. So I looked at the other lady, and she seems to be going in some kind of pattern. So I started vacuuming that pattern she was going in. It still didn't seem like anything was happening. So I watched her some more, and she seemed to be going really slow. So I thought, well, going slow, maybe that's the secret, is going slow. Well, she was just going slow, I don't know. Well, then Josh walked up, and he looked at the vacuum cleaner, looked at me, looked at the vacuum cleaner, he pulled the back, up, back of it off, pulled the cord off of it, walked over, plugged into the wall, and then I started vacuuming. 
You see, I had a form of vacuuming, didn't I? But not any power. I looked, I was trying to do what she was doing, right? But the truth is, you know, you've heard the expression that cleanliness is next to godliness. The truth is, cloneliness is not next to godliness. God does a work in our hearts, and we got to have the we got can't have just the form of it. We've got to have the power behind it. And Timothy goes on to say that these guys are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then Timothy, he goes on to say that, uh, that these fellows will do this. They will heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear, not what God wants them to hear. That's a crowd that has a form of godliness. So he says, if you seem to be religious, all right, if you do these things and people see them on the outside, you seem to be religious. You have a pattern of prayer that people see. You have a pattern of going to services that people see. But he says this, If any of them seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth with his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. And that is powerful right there. The way I read that, I read it this way. If your faith inside of you doesn't control your tongue on the outside, your religion is worthless. Man. And I know each one of us have probably one time or another said some things that we didn't, don't wish to repeat or wish we hadn't said. Probably even to loved ones that we care about. And we're sorry we've said it. But the Bible says if it doesn't control your tongue, there's a problem. There's some verses that talk about it, um, about that, about the tongue. <laughs> wow, I had a lot more of an introduction, didn't I? Man. Uh, number one, it controls your tongue. Uh, verse 26, so we already said that. It says in Proverbs 18, 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, Love it, shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 21, 23. But whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Chapter 3 is all about the tongue there. Look what it says, chapter 3, verse 3 in James. It says this, behold, it says, for if, verse 2, if for any man, uh, it, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven by of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Fire of hell. So the Bible says the tongue is a powerful thing. When it starts something like a fire, it keeps on going. But he, James, illustrates it three ways. He talks about the ship, and the ship is controlled by him. It talks about the horse being controlled by the bit. And it talks about a fire, how the tongue just starts a small fire and takes off. Now, when I went to Liberty and uh, took a course, took some courses there about preaching, which, which uh, where you practice preaching in front of other people, other students, which was kind of silly because it's really not an intellectual event, um, preaching. Preaching is more of a spiritual event, although I guess maybe there's some, some benefit to it. I don't know. He says, uh, uh, they told us there, they said, make sure when you preach and you give an illustration, don't give more than one illustration about a point. So I learned two things about James here. He thinks this tongue is very important, this issue of the tongue, because of three illustrations. And number two, it's a sure good thing James didn't go to Liberty University. He thinks it's a big deal, and the tongue, we all know it really is a big deal. And he says, if it doesn't control, your religion doesn't control your tongue, your religion is worthless. It's worthless. Also, I would say this, if it doesn't control your works, pure religion controls your works. Look at uh, the next part of this. 
It says, And brieth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own self. This man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. I want to back up a little to that part. It says, Pure religion and undefiled before God. So I want to say some things about pure religion. And that is this. Claiming to be religious does not approve you before God. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Also, it says this, it says religion before God. So I'd say pure religion is not before God. I mean, it's before God and not before man. Remember, Jesus got quite upset with some men in Matthew 6, 2. Therefore, here was his commandment. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, don't sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 23, 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So a religion that's bef a pure religion is before God and not before men. That's not the purpose of it. I remember when King David committed adultery. He said, I have sinned before God and God alone. Pure religion is a heart condition. And because of that, those who have a unpure religion have a misplacement of priorities. Luke eleven forty two. Jesus said, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment. The love of God and the love of God. These you ought to have done and not to leave the others undone. And Matthew 15, 8, he said this to the same crowd. These people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but in their heart far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And you remember what Samuel said. He said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings as, and sacrifices as obedience? It's better to obey than to sacrifice, to hearken than to the fat of rams. God didn't just want them to follow a religion. He wanted to have a relationship. That was a true statement. But pure religion is what shows up on the outside when the inside has been changed by God Almighty. So we said, number one, it controls the tongue. Number two, pure religion controls your works. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So if you have a true, a pure religion inside of you, and it comes from the Holy Spirit of God, it will control the works on the outside. And what he, this is, now this is not a treatise on religion. Doesn't cover everything we should do, does it? That'd be silly. I don't know there is a passage in the Bible that covers everything on one topic. Even over there in Corinthians when it talks about love, it's pretty extensive. I don't think it's got everything in there. But this is, he's saying this, he's saying that if you have a pure religion, you will be concerned about the weak and the, and the poor. Pure religion and the Father before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Who are the fatherless? Who are the widows? And especially in the Bible times, they were the weakest of all. They had no representation in government. They had no representation at the town hall. They had no representation in the religious realm. They didn't have a father. They didn't have a husband. Or they didn't have a husband. Or they didn't have a father. They were the weakest of all society. And boy, you know, it's not very nice to see at school when someone's picking on someone else. and You know, I don't like that too much. But what makes me more upset than that is when I see someone else come along and join in on the one that's picking on the one that's being picked on. That makes me really mad. Because they are choosing to side with this one who is stronger and God wants us to be concerned about the weak of society. God wants us to be concerned about those who don't have strength, can't take care of themselves. 
And we need to visit those. So I would say, secondly, if you have a religion, if you have pure religion inside of you, it shows up on the outside, it controls your works. And then thirdly, pure religion controls the world's influence on your life. Look at the end of this here. It says, To visit the fathers and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. This is an illustration that somehow when you're in the world, and there are sins, and there are things going on in the world, they're going to affect you in a way that they actually show up on you. You start off with a pure garment. I remember someone preached a really good sermon about the garments of Christ one time. And you got that pure garment and you're living for God and you get up against or near the sins of the world, they start showing up on your person. Because we start to say, well, that's not too bad, right? That's not too bad. I'm doing okay. That, that's not that much of a sin. And the closer we get to it, the less we react. But 1 John 2.15 was pretty strong about it. He said this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then James 4.4, 4, jump over just one chapter, and I think it's even stronger here. He says this, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Here's the definition of spiritual adultery. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So then what do we do? What is he saying here? Is he saying is the best thing for us to do is just avoid the world? If we avoid the world, we can't minister to the world. If we avoid the world, we can't lead people to Christ. If we stay out of the world, but the trick is, if you have a changed heart, if you have a pure religion, it's going to show up on the outside so that the world, it controls the world's influence in your life. My wife found that movie Time Changer I mentioned in one of the sermons here previously on Sunday. Uh, and it's about um, a college professor in the 1890s. And they're having this dispute because one, of, one professor writes a book about taking the principles of the Bible to the world without the name of Christ. And he says, these are all good principles, they're all biblical principles, but they take out the name of Jesus. And the other pre professor, who is the guy from Love Boat, what was his name? McLeod. Remember that guy? Anyway, the guy from Love Boat, remember him? No. Yeah? No, you know you watch Love Boat. <laughs> Don't act like you didn't dodge it. He says, he says, no, if you take out the name of Jesus and you take these principles to the world, there'll be no authority. And it won't take long for it all fall away. And so, of course, in the movie Time Changer, there's a time machine. He gets in the t and he convinces this guy to get in the time machine to see the results of his book. And he comes to the modern times and he looks around at the world and the world's gone berserk. But I'm less concerned about how the world reacts than I was about the church. He comes into the church and he says, still seems to be about the same message, but nobody is excited. Nobody cares. Everybody's sitting there twiddling their thumbs the whole time during the service. And one guy, a very strange moment, if you haven't seen the movie, very strange moment, he asked him if he could see his Bible, this guy at church. He said, oh, that's a nice Bible you got there. That's a really nice cover on there. Boy, I like the leather on there. And I was like, that is such a weird scene. I don't understand what he's saying. But what I got out of that was people today were more concerned about the quality of the leather on their Bible than they were concerned about the quality of the words in their book. And that's the way we see the church today quite often, more concerned. So if you were able to go back in time, and that's the only thing, or, or if you lived and you were able to come forward in time, you would be shocked about the things that you see. And I think he illustrates it this way. You get up in the morning, and your son's off to school, and you put him in some nice clothes, you put him in a white garment, and he goes off, and he decides to hang out with his friends after school and watch a movie, and there just happens to be a, something in there he shouldn't have watched. There just happens to be a few words he probably shouldn't have heard. But he said, it's just a movie. And he comes home and dad says, what's the spot there on your pants there? He said, oh dad, it's not a big deal. It's just a movie. 
But then I remember a verse that says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Then the daughter is sent out the same day, and she's got on her white garment. She loves Jesus, been living for Jesus, and she comes home that night, and there's a few spots on her dress, or on her dress down here, whatever. And she said, Dad says, what's that? Oh, it's not a big deal. It's just a magazine, and in this magazine, the popular way to dress is very skimpy. And I'm doing that just a little bit now, Dad. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Just a spot. Well, then Dad goes off, and he comes home. And the wife wonders what he, what's on his garment. He says, not a big deal. Me and the guys were at work telling so I heard some dirty jokes and started to talk like that just a little, but it's not a big deal. Well, I say James makes a big deal about allowing the world to influence us. And he says that if you have a pure religion, if the Holy Spirit of God is inside of you and it's living out to you, you'll be able to or you will be in the world and be able to minister to the world and witness to the world, but you won't love the things of the world. Pure religion shows up on the outside, gives you power to live for God. So I say this, lessons, lesson number one was what we believe will show up or affect our actions. Lesson, sometimes man-made religion is humorous, but God's religion is a serious business. Lesson, if we have pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father, it's this. So we'll visit the fathers and the widows in affliction. We'll keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And this tongue right here, this tongue right here will not be set on hell. Let's pray.